because it's always different, but if you ever need... Now, I've never been much of a shipper. I think the first ship I ever telegraphed was Harry Potter and Cho Chang, and while I was a little sad they didn't work things out, I never hated Harry Ginny. And I accept it as the natural progression of their story, but when I was a kid watching Buffy the Vampire Slayer for the first time, about ten years after it first aired, there was one ship I fell in love with and was willing to die on a hill for. This isn't going where you think. Very quickly, Willow became my favourite character. Well, look at me. I'm all fuzzy. I'd loved and adored Sarah Michelle Gellar in just about everything I saw her in beforehand, but when I finally got around to watching the show that made her famous, I strangely preferred her more as these gals. I don't got this. I'm more receptive to Buffy as a character these days, and can appreciate her performance, but younger me was all about Willow. You know Buffy? Sweet girl, not that bright. Alison Hannigan's work continues to impress me with how she transformed a shy, bumbling nerd into a powerful, confident witch across seven seasons without once making her feel like the characterization was betrayed. It's all about emotional control, plus obviously magic. It's still a marvel to me how Alison can effortlessly be adorably hilarious in one scene and heartbreakingly emotional in the next. One of the reasons I kinda sorta love the Magic as Drugs storyline in Season 6 and the subsequent Dark Willow thing is the strength of this gal's performance. Back off before somebody gets hurt. How about I back off right after? So now I've hopefully established my love and devotion to this character, and can convey that if they were going to put her into a relationship with anyone other than me and have me accept it, said partner had better be the perfect match for her. Enter Oz. That kinda hurt. Kinda. Oz represents a good example of how to create a love interest that exists to put someone in a relationship without feeling like you're actually doing that. How special are we talking? He complimented Willow, and his very presence helped her become a better person. Unfortunately, by season four, Seth Green had grown creatively dissatisfied, and schedule conflicts with another film meant he had to be written out only six episodes into the season. Don't you love me? <laughs> My whole life. Never loved anything else. As heart wrenching as Oz and Willow's breakup was, it proved beneficial in the long run. Yours. Amber Benson was introduced the same season as a character called Tara McClay. She was not intended to be a love interest for Willow outright, since although Joss Whedon had envisioned one of the main cast turning out to be gay, he was actually leaning more towards Xander being the candidate. The main reason for Tara's introduction was because Willow had become significantly more powerful over the four seasons, and thus was no longer able to convincingly be put in danger the way she used to. So they needed a new character that could serve as their resident distressed damsel. Amber Benson almost wasn't cast because, well, Joss Whedon had his body preferences. Marty Noxon, however, could see that the vulnerability she brought to the character was what they ultimately needed. I, I understand. Through a combination of convenient timing and the surprising chemistry between the two actresses, their friendship was eventually written to have them become a couple. Are you too involved? <laughs> in what became a shocking move for the series, the episode New Moon Rising, in which Oz returns, ended with him and Willow parting on good terms, and Willow choosing to stay with Tara. You have to be with the person you lo love. I am. To say this was met with an uproar would be an understatement. Willow and Oz had been a popular pairing, and in the far less enlightened early 2000s, the idea that Willow would not only turn down Oz, but do so in favour of another woman? To cut a long story short, Amber Benson was met with so many nasty comments that she nearly left the show. But of course, she didn't. And I want to highlight just how impressive it was that this character was despised for no reason other than the fact that Willow chose her over Oz. And then, at the end of season 6 when she was written out, there was even more backlash. While I love Oz, it's impossible for me to ignore that his successor became just as, if not more popular. And her successor was the most despised character in the entire franchise. I think it's true. Seriously, there are Xander fans, Wesley fans, and even the odd Riley fan. I will be very surprised if this video reveals the rare thing known as a Kennedy fan. Tara was that tough an act to follow. 
The Willow and Tara relationship was not the first time a queer romance had been depicted on TV, and nor was Buffy the first series to have an established character suddenly come out after being assumed straight beforehand. But compare the sitcom Ellen, in which the title character came out alongside her actress, and was met with a lot of criticism for the tone shifts that followed, with people such as Elton John telling Ellen to shut up about being gay and start being funny again. Buffy was notable for not having a big coming out moment or a very special episode about homophobia. Just left me in the basement to terrorize your girlfriend? It also stood out for avoiding the other end of the spectrum. The Willow and Tara relationship was treated with the same grace and seriousness as any other on the show. Incidental and unstereotypical. It was positive representation without beating you over the head with it. Queer viewers could see themselves in either character and find comfort and relatability. Straight viewers could see another perspective and learn to normalise the idea. Do you get it at all? I do. The relationship had an uphill struggle behind the scenes, with restrictions on what the characters could or couldn't be shown doing, forcing the writers to use magic as a metaphor for exploring their sexuality. They didn't share their first on-screen kiss until season 5's The Body, after 18 episodes as a couple. But despite those restrictions, they still stood out as being a same-sex couple on a major show in which they were accepted as a vital part of the main cast, both powerful and fallible in their own ways, and existing as independent characters in their own right, rather than tokens there to meet a quota. And while there was obviously a bigger focus on Willow at first, since she'd been on the show since it started, the writers quickly began to explore Tara's character in interesting ways. The 90s were the era of aggressive, in-your-face girl power, in which women declared that they could do exactly what the men did, and asserted their strength in a multitude of ways. Buffy expressed her strength through physical prowess and razor-sharp wit. Willow expressed hers through intelligence and later unrivaled magic powers. Cordelia and Anya likewise stood out for their unfiltered, independent attitudes towards life that were then refined through character development to being unafraid to do the right thing. Tara stood out by being defined through her kindness and empathy. Well, m maybe we could... Yeah. Could... Tara? She is introduced as the only Wiccan at a college meeting who listens to Willow and validates her interest in pursuing more advanced spellcasting. She then acts as Willow's guide and mentor to help improve her powers, remaining an understanding and empathetic teacher the whole time. Even when meeting Oz, she is understanding of the idea that he and Willow might get back together, despite how much pain this would cause her. Do what makes you... <laughs> Throughout the series, kindness and compassion would be her defining characteristics, and showing that she is far more than just the nice character, her first episode establishes that she is also a powerful witch in her own right, providing Willow with enough assistance to fight off the gentleman. This helped set her apart from, say, Dawn, who ended up in distress so much that the show itself had to lampshade it. Dawn's in trouble. Must be Tuesday. Tara was given just enough competency that her ending up in trouble was never annoying, and she justified her presence in the main cast. This made her an easy character to root for and accept. Once she was established as Willow's girlfriend, the show set about developing her into her own person, so as not to remain a satellite character. You're not an outsider. Kinda am. The season 5 episode Family properly delves into her backstory, revealing that she comes from a history of abuse, and has been brought up to think that she'll turn into a demon when she reaches adulthood. Don't you see how out of control you are? This story serves to put the audience on Tara's side, where we see that she fears Willow and the others will reject her if they discover this. I can't wait till your little friends find out the truth about you. We're shown what she's had to put up with from her family, explaining her shyness and vulnerability, and thus endearing her to us all. So in the end, when the demon thing is revealed to be just a lie to keep the women in the family in line, the episode celebrates that Tara can remain within the main cast. I'm not a demon. You're not a demon. Also, her relative's disapproval of her interest in magic and witchcraft is an effective parallel to her sexuality, making the family of choice theme very relatable. You're dealing with all of us. The episode ends with an affirmation that Tara is an essential part of the group and the show but I'd argue that the most significant turning point in her character development isn't actually from an episode that centers around her. I know it's not my place, but there's things. Season 5's The Body is considered one of the best episodes of the entire series, and it is important for Tara, not just because it features her and Willow's first on-screen kiss. My mother died when I was 17. This right here gives Tara a role that only she can fill in the show. 
someone who has experienced the loss of her mother at a young age and can relate to what Buffy and indeed Dawn are feeling. If you ever need. And as someone who didn't know Joyce as well as the others, she's able to be the one who can hold it together and be a rock for everyone. We're normally used to seeing Willow reassuring Tara or being the stronger partner, but this allows Tara to fill that role too, putting them on an equal footing. You can be strong. In the next episode, Forever, Tara establishes her identity as someone with a different perspective from Willow in what would be a recurring source of conflict for them. This spells backfire? That's not the point. That's not the point. Willow, the witch who came to the craft late, always wants to bend the rules and push the limits of what she can accomplish, while Tara, the natural witch, knows and respects these limits and doesn't like meddling with the natural order. You, you make things float and disappear but and- you don't mess with life and death. Conflict between them is further explored in the episode Tough Love, highlighting another part of Tara that distinguishes her as her own person, the inner belief that Willow sees her as just an experiment and will go back to boys as soon as she loses interest in her. You think that? Should I? And while this isn't great for Willow to hear, it serves to reaffirm that Tara is her own person with her own thoughts and fears, and not just an extension of her girlfriend. You're, you're changing so much, so fast. I don't know where you're heading. Where I'm heading? She is then the one who's targeted by Glory and has her mind... Well, I don't know what the technical term is, but because of that, Tara then reveals the season's big secret to the villain. Such pure green energy. That scene may be a little clunky, but the act itself further puts Tara on an equal footing with the main cast. Things now only happen because of her that can only be done by her. A conflict set up by her disharmony with another character that then leads to the turning point towards the finale, and now she becomes the secondary part of the main tension. It won't be long. It's not just, will they protect Dawn and stop Glory, but now, will they save Tara too? And once it happens in the big battle, Tara contributes in a way that reminds the audience that she is also a powerful witch, just like Willow. That'll continue into the next season. So season 5 ends with Tara no longer being just Willow but less powerful, but an important character who serves the narrative. The two-part episode that opens Buffy's first season on the UPN network is the best season premiere across the entire series, beginning what is my second favourite Buffy season after three. We're talking about raising the dead. It's time we stop talking. Tara is one of four characters preparing a dark spell to resurrect Buffy from the dead, after she sacrificed herself at the end of season five. It is wrong. It's against all the laws of nature and practically impossible to do, but it's what we agreed to. Initially on board with the idea, we see that aforementioned conflict come into play, when it's clarified how Willow has been hiding some of the darker parts of the spell, because Tara is the one who would question her. And one of the things I love about this episode is how it shows Tara rising to the occasion. This level. In a crisis where Willow is too drained to be their heavy hitter, Tara steps it up and demonstrates how she's a force to be reckoned with too. And I don't want to gloss over this badass moment either. Nobody messes with my girl. Like in The Body, we're shown that when Buffy is MIA, it is Tara who the group really needs. She keeps everyone together and ensures they stay on track. And what is the next significant development in her story this season? Tara is the first one to become aware of Willow's increasing problems with magic use, and what happens next becomes a fascinatingly ironic twist in the tale where Willow erases Tara's memory of their arguments just in time for the musical episode, in which Tara gets an entire song to herself titled Under Your Spell. While a double meaning to the memory erasing Willow did, it's mainly about how their relationship has helped her come out of her shell and shine to her full potential. How you set me free, brought me out so easily. Besides designating her as important enough to have her own solo, the song serves as an important next step in something very hard she has to do. How could you, Willow? In the episode Tabula Rasa, when Willow's problems become impossible to ignore and it's clear she can't be reasoned with, Tara breaks up with her. I think we both need some, I don't know, space. 
Despite how much it hurts her to leave, and the cold reaction she gets from Dawn in response, she walks out because she now knows her own self-worth and understands her right to be treated with respect. But you don't get to decide what is better for us, Will. At a point in the series where Buffy and Willow fall so low they resort to using the ones they care about, Xander and Dawn just hurt people, and Giles abandons someone who needs his guidance, Tara has reached her peak in knowing when to stand up for herself and not tolerate mistreatment. And she doesn't punish the other characters who cared about her for Willow's actions. She still makes an effort to be involved in Dawn's life after the breakup, even staying over at the house after Buffy and Willow are out all night. Even though Dawn is on paper just the little sister of her girlfriend's best friend, and Tara has no obligation to keep in contact with her, she still looks out for her and tries to provide some stability. But Tara's friendship with Buffy is something that just made me love her even more. Maybe I came back wrong. No, Buffy, that's not... No, you didn't. And like in the previous season, this creates a role for Tara that only she could fulfill. Do you love him? It it's okay if you do. Buffy could never talk to Xander or Willow about her relationship problems. Giles is out of the picture and, well, Anya isn't the sort of person you kiss and tell to. I'm just saying what everyone's thinking. Tara, meanwhile, is outside the group at this point, so Buffy feels safer going to her about problems. And Tara again shares this understanding with Buffy that allows her to open up, having feelings that you're ashamed of, and worrying you're biologically wrong for things outside your control. He's done a lot of good, and, and, he, and he does love you. The script for this scene in Dead Things originally had a line where Tara drew parallels between her being a lesbian who's had to hide her relationships to Buffy being ashamed of hers with Spike. And it's not drawn attention to, but Tara herself was recently in a relationship with someone who could be very virtuous, but also had a dark side and was doing bad things that it was getting impossible to ignore and justify. I, I won't tell anyone. I, I wouldn't do that. Tara is able to provide that support to Buffy and be there for her, and making sure Spike stays in line. A muscle cramp? In your... pants? And even with regards to Willow, she's supportive of her attempts to get clean in a healthy enough way. She's been doing really well. You'd be proud of her. Good, that's, that's good. Take this scene in Older and Far Away, where Anya is trying to pressure Willow to cast a spell that will allow them to leave the house they've been magically trapped in. I can't. If I start, I... I might not be able to stop. While the metaphor doesn't really land, how many life or death situations require alcohol or drugs to get out of, the sentiment does. She said no, and that's it. You're not going to make her do something that she doesn't want to. And if you try, you're going to have to go through me first. Tara stands up for Willow, recognizing that she is trying to be better, and again serving as that grounding presence who prevents the others from falling apart. By her final episode, this shy wallflower who put up with mistreatment for so long has transformed into a confident, passionate woman who stands up for what she believes in, will lay down boundaries that she will not tolerate the disrespect of, but also balances that with being 100% there for her loved ones, and not hesitating to help someone in need. I hate to constantly reference Game of Thrones, but the development of Sansa makes for a good contrast. My hands will never harm me. I haven't fed them in seven days, you said it yourself. Both she and Tara start out in perpetual victim mode, and their powerlessness is frequently emphasised. I don't pray anymore. Sansa's character development into empowered woman involves shedding her femininity and the attributes that defined her virtues in opposition to her flaws, most notably her compassion and ability to be smarter than she's given credit for. What are you praying for? For the gods to have mercy on us all. Even me. Of course, Your Grace. Someone who took pity on a drunk knight, became friends with an inexperienced handmaiden, comforted several scared women in a war zone, and stood up for her husband when his family tried to publicly humiliate him, develops into someone who smirks after feeding a man to his own hounds, nearly has her own sister assassinated, trash talks a woman who's literally fighting on the front lines for her, and her reaction to being indirectly responsible for an entire city of innocence being destroyed is... I wish there had been another way. Tara's character development allowed her to become stronger and more confident, while still retaining the virtues that were built into her characterization from the beginning. She doesn't become perfect, and I'd argue that restarting her relationship with Willow at the end of Entropy probably wasn't the wisest move that she herself admits. But hey, she's human. There's just so much to work through. And then what happens? Your shirt. 
The real twist of Buffy Season 6 is that the trio of Warren, Jonathan, and Andrew aren't the true big bads. Their actions just unleash the real one. Something terrible has happened, I know, but you don't have to do- I need power. Enraged and distressed at Tara's accidental death, Willow goes off the deep end and first just tries to kill the three boys in revenge, but then escalates into trying to destroy the world to alleviate her pain. So, here we are. It's probably my favourite arc in the series, or well, close enough. And even though Tara isn't technically involved in this arc, what with her dying to start it off, it still speaks to the strength of her character. Tara had previously shown herself as the anchor who kept the group grounded in the aftermaths of deaths or absences, and it was her leaving Willow and being less involved with the group that led to them falling apart. So her death is indeed what allows for things to escalate this way. Remove the group's anchor from the equation permanently, and the conflict increases for maximum drama, and therefore excitement. And because Tara was such a beloved character, it just adds to the emotional investment. Come on, this is a huge deal for me. Six years as a sideman, now I get to be the Slayer. We don't just want Buffy to stop Willow because the world ending would be a downer in general. We want Willow to be stopped before she crosses lines in a way that Tara herself wouldn't want, and that she would permanently stop being the character we know and love. You can't stop this. Tara's death also forces things like Xander and Anya to actually talk about their issues rather than what they'd actually been doing in the fallout of the wedding, or Buffy to stop seeing Dawn as just someone to protect and closer to an equal member of the team. You think I never watched you? And the resolution to this storyline is not an elaborate spell, fight routine, or comically large weapon, but having compassion for the monster and stopping the apocalypse with an act of love, which arguably is a very Tara solution to things. I love you. <laughs> Despite Tara dying at the end of Season 6, there were plans to bring her back in various capacities before the series ended. Given that the big bad of Season 7 could impersonate anyone on the show who's died, she was a prime candidate for that. Things are more clear where Tara is, where we are. The episode Conversations with Dead People was in fact supposed to have her in this scene instead of Cassie, but Amber Benson turned it down. Her reasoning being that the Willow-Tara relationship had meant so much, and been a lifeline to many viewers who had related to it, that seeing Tara as an evil being telling Willow to die would just destroy people. I stand by my opinion. The world would be a better place if you took a razor blade to your wrist. Stop. You can read the script for that scene in the link below, and yeah, it's good, but what we got with Cassie was just as effective. I can see it now. Candlelight. The Indigo Girls playing. Picture of your dead girlfriend on your bloody lap. Stop it. There was also a proposed episode where Buffy would get one wish from the powers that be and consider using it to say, restore Angel's humanity, defeat the first for good, or bring her mother back to life. And it would end with her showing off a new pair of shoes to Willow, letting her believe she used the wish for that, before stepping aside to reveal Tara. The reason for this not happening was initially just that Amber Benson had a directing opportunity in the UK, but she later confessed the following. I had had some issues with somebody on the show, and it had kind of come to a head just as I was getting ready to leave. Leaving the show was sad because there were some of the crew and writers and some of the cast that I just adore, but I had made my peace with that person and the show, and I was done. I'm leaving everything in a good place. I don't need to come back. Would the series have been served well by having Tara come back from the dead? On the one hand, that part of Season 7 showing Willow dealing with mourning her and learning to balance magic on her own is pretty strong. On the other, Kennedy, am I right? Part of me feels that Buffy was never the sort of show to have that wish-fulfillment element. On something like Charmed, yeah, no bother. But Buffy always had this gloomy, 90s, life sucks, do what you can with it vibe. Mainly from Joss Whedon's mantra that happy people make for boring television, Bringing Tara back may have been little more than fan service, and it's actually another actor on the show commenting on their character that helps me come down on the side of letting Tara stay dead. Are you sure? Emma Caulfield spoke about how Anya was killed off in the finale, and unfortunately I can't remember the exact quote or where to find it, but she used the fact that people were upset at the death, and that it affected them, as a sign that she was successful as a character, since a death that no one cared about would hardly be an example of good writing. Trust has to be built again, on both sides. Tara was lucky in that she got the generous treatment from the writers. 
never being given these low moments that were less organic character flaws and more WTF Whedon. Get dressed if you can find your clothes and push off, because if I can't have all of you, I'd rather... Hey, that's cheating. I mean, Willow will probably be the character I love most overall. Buffy is great, and Oz can't be touched. Gotta love Anya and Cordelia too. But I think Tara easily had the best development, and avoided any nasty derailment that virtually nearly everyone else got at some point. I knew this was gonna happen. And she's a tantamount to what the show did right, and what holds up about it all these years later. Can we just skip it? Can, can you just be kissing me now? There was not fair.